们一起分享一下他在呃生态旅游这个领域的一些独到的见解，以及他在这个过程当中的一些个人的经历和感受。我觉得对于大家来说，这是一个非常非常好的呃一个学习和交流的机会。呃，除了这个 Brown 以外哈，我想再介绍一下。然后我们另外一位的陪同嘉宾是呃那个何导，那他同时也是我们一位大一同学，新年快乐哈！也非常感谢他能够帮我们去搭建这样一个桥梁。然后那何导呢，也是长期从事自然生态旅游，已经有十多年的时间，也是我们国内比较早从事生态旅游的这样一位。啊，生态旅游经营者，他同时也是一位，对，所以这是一个非常难得的这么一个机会。呃，走，嗯 ，After speech， 我有他们的课，你可以去 chance for for all of you， 就是那结呃，我们一个小时大概会给到 Brown 的这样一个时间，然后之后呢，我们会留给大家一些时间来做一个深入交流。呃，我希望大家呃，待会儿能够就你们担心的问题。和我们的这个 Brown 的以及何大啊，能够做一些深入的沟通。那接下来我们就以非常热烈的掌声欢迎我们的 Brown， 谢谢。OK， 那么感谢。Okay, hello guys. I hope everybody can understand me.、Um, my name in、uh, USA is Brad, but I know it's hard to sometimes say that, so you can call me Hesong. Hesong. Yeah, because I love、um, I love the moon bear, Hesong. Okay, so I think the reason I'm here is、uh, Chini invited me to do this. I've known Chini since she was very, very young, very small, and、uh, and then I began working in China in 2008. And I'll kind of tell you the story. But my the reason I'm here is I was asking Chini how how is the how is university how is the tourism program how are the students? She said good. She said、uh, I said. Do the students enjoy the classes? And she said, No, some of, many of them do not. I said, Why? She said, Well, they're studying tourism and they think it's boring. I said, Well, then why do they study tourism?、And、she said, Because the parents have forced them to study what they want. And I said, Tourism is not boring. <laughs> I said, My life is many things.、Uh, boring is not one of them. So, and so, and、uh, I'm also going to go through. What what ecotourism specifically is? So it's it's not just normal tourism; it's tourism with a focus on appreciating nature. And why is that important? Why is it good?、Uh, it actually can help us save the world. And so I work all over the world for ecotourism. I've been doing it.、Uh, I started my my college was in wildlife biology. I graduated from. University in Alaska in、um, wildlife biology. Maybe you're going to get a good job with the government, study animals, publish the papers, do whatever. Maybe be a ranger or something. But I started、um, working for the government. But actually, my job was to guide people to see bears, brown bears, in Alaska, and、uh, I really loved that. And I thought, wow, I think I actually like nature guiding more than being a, a scientist. And I believe that because I've dedicated my life to this,、uh, that I've done more to help conserve the nature than I ever would have been able to do as a biologist. And you may think, why? All, you, all I do is take people to see animals and take care of them. But I will tell you, show you these stories, the things that I've done, to in, and to inspire you guys.、Uh, it's very important、uh, for me. My I love always love nature, animals, birds, all these things. So much, I'm obsessed with these things since I was born. Not just I was born with it. So I would have always told myself is I've gotten so much appreciation from nature that I just before as before I die I want to know that I gave back as much as I could to something that I love. So I'm going to tell you some of the successes of what I've done, not bragging, not saying look at me how great I am. I'm saying this is what I've done and this is what worked. I want to inspire you guys. I believe that China is changing very fast. I probably I probably understand China more than almost 100% of the United States citizens, and I also love it. And I love the Chinese people. I love the nature in China, and I have a great understanding for America. 
but China is very misunderstood. American, the average American has a certain um, image of China, and it's not accurate. It's not, and uh, they just don't know. But I do, and so what I try to do is, is teach um, as much as I can, focus on the positive things, the people in China that love nature, so they need a lot of, also to try to set a good example. So I don't only work in China, so I'm gonna also talk about the places, the other places that I work. So I started out, um, was one of the very first guides to uh, take people to, into the remote wilderness um, and to see these uh, brown bears, the Zongchang. And uh, it was really one of the first people to, to do what's called uh, bear viewing. But now bear viewing is a huge driver of the economy of this part of Alaska. And it's easy because people love bears. People love bears uh, for many reasons, but that's where it all started. So this is my job in the summer for, and, uh, for 25 years, is uh, basically taking people out to see these beautiful bears, help them fall in love with the bears. I love the bears, I want other people to love them too. If you love something, you want to protect it. So now, over 20 something years, thousands of people have, I have made fall in love with bears. And then you'll notice the no pebble mine at the bottom. Um, I'll explain that in a minute. So what, what, other than me making money to see the bears, well people love them, and, if, uh, and so now, there are many, many people that want to support the conservation of bears. And so, bears are beautiful animals. They're also misunderstood. So learning how to appreciate them is very, very important. And why is it important? Well, would you, everywhere I go, it's the people who are attracted to a certain animal. It'd be hard for me to bring people to China because I want to show them a beautiful salamander. They don't care. But panda, okay. Alaska, to show them some sort of bird, probably not. But brown bears, those beautiful mothers with the cubs, yeah, so they come there. So if we say, I love the bears, I love pandas, and then the other animals, orangutans, snow leopard, polar bears, then if they, then they, if they decide they love it, so they have to protect it. You know, for us, we, a lot of what drives the United States and the decisions are the votes from the people. So what politician is going to come in that's either going to destroy nature or protect it? So as I build this um, love of nature, starting with the bears, if you want to have bears, you have to have a big area of intact wilderness. If you want to have pandas in the mountains, you have to have big areas of connected wilderness. It's easy to make people fall in love with pandas. Do uh, you guys like pandas? Nishiwan, Niman Shiwan, Shoma? Well, Mego Dren, Hun Shiwan, Zong Shang. So they love brown bears also. So there was something that happened, an area was, they were going to try to put in the largest open pit gold mine in the world, which would destroy so much habitat and also potentially poison the water from the waste products of the mining. Well, when you think about how much money that the, we would get from this, it was very difficult to convince people. Well, people that love salmon um, didn't want it, and also now people that love bears. So I've lot, helped lots of people fall in love with bears. So I was even on um, several TV programs um, to teach the United States, like we have to fight this mine. We fought, fought it for 15 years. With social media, for things like you know, getting in touch with, this is a very famous um, person from CNN named Bill Weir. And uh, that mine actually did get shut down. The, the, the idea of it didn't start. So that was a huge um, benefit. And really, for a lot of it all started with the ecotourism of seeing the bears. I also guided for 13 years to take people to see uh, the polar bear. Why is that important? Well, it's easy to not fall in love with polar bear because everybody thinks that they like to eat people. But if you can take them up and show the people how beautiful these animals are, then they fall in love with them. Can anybody tell me why it's important 
that a lot of people want to love the polar bear? Any, any ideas? What's that? How, how is the love of polar bears going to save the world? Why? I, I can almost hear it. Okay. Well, if you want polar bears to survive, you have to have a cold arctic for the ice. Without ice, the polar bears cannot survive. They have to have ice to have seals. If climate change and global warming happen, the polar bears will go extinct. So for people to love polar bears, it helps them make decisions on who is going to decide things in our nation and the world. Does that make sense? Good? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think that taking people into the Arctic to make them fall in love with polar bears is very boring. That's, that's my job. And more recently, I've been um, helping to develop uh, tourism for in the Himalayas of India for the snow leopard. Shui Bao. Also live in uh, China. Um, China has most of the snow leopards in the world. Years ago, um, the snow leopard is maybe the hardest animal to ever see in the wild. You could try for 10 years and never see one. Well, we've begun to figure out how you can actually reliably find the snow leopards. Then we bring people. They spend money. We hire the guides. We hire the porters, the cooks at the camp. And then all of a sudden now, the snow leopard has a value. So the locals will continue, well, will we'll begin to really uh, protect them because that's how they make their living. Supporting ecotourism creates, puts a value on these beautiful natural resources and animals. It's very important for people to fall in love with snow leopards. The first time you ever see a, a foreigner, what are we doing? We fly all the way from all over the world to see the snow. It's a picture I already These children in there now, now realize how valuable these snow leopards are. We've actually already hired those um, kids to work for us. Sean, do more. Sean, do more. Sean, do more. Anyway, uh, so I've got lots of people that fall in love with snow leopards. And so it's really easy for me during the pandemic, I had the team of people that I work with in, in this region of India, they also did not have any work. The one bad thing about tourism is if there's a pandemic, it's difficult because nobody can travel. But anyway, um, so I was able to use social media to raise uh, $6,000 just asking on Facebook or something to put these guys to work during the pandemic. And what did they do? We bought a bunch of fencing. So we could put over the places where they keep the baby sheep and the baby yaks at night. All they need to do is have a fence go over it. So then the snow leopard can't come in and eat their livestock. So they see a value of people coming in. All of a sudden now, um, the snow leopard team now has protected their livestock. 
So now the conservation of the snow leopard is, is, is excellent. Now it's easy for me to help people fall in love with snow leopards because now they're there, they're protected, we can see them. Why is it important that people fall in love with snow leopards? Same thing as the polar bear. As uh, global warming will also make the snow leopard go extinct because they have to be in a very high area. And, um, and it's, it's causing a lot of problems as the glaciers go away. So again, we found um, more reason to take nature seriously. It really all starts with the tourism. So I also guided Borneo. And the orangutan is the umbrella species. That's all I, in the beginning I tell you. You know, it's the polar bear, the orangutan, snow leopard, um, they're, it's called an umbrella species. If you want orangutans, you have to, you have to keep the whole um, area, like big vast area. It's not hard to conserve for the white grub laughing thrush. All you need is a park, and then they live there. But if you want to have a, uh, orangutan, you have to have area of vast, very intact rainforest. So people come to see the orangutans because people love orangutans. So I've been working there, doing this in, since 2015. Malaysia and Indonesia. Okay, so you know Borneo, right? What's the Chinese word for Borneo? Polo Zhou. Polo Zhou. Okay, Malaysia, Polo Zhou. It's a very diverse place. Polo Zhou. Borneo is split up into 75% of Borneo is owned by Indonesia, unfortunately. They are terrible at the, their resources. But Malaysian Borneo, they've made much better decisions on how to preserve over the years to save this rainforest and save the orangutans. Now, Borneo is one of the hottest ecotourism destinations, and they're reaping very big economic benefits because they were very smart starting in the 1990s to conserve their whole rainforest. So, this, especially this region up in the north, of Sabah, which is part of Malaysian Borneo, uh, they set a really good example to other Asian countries <clears throat> that if you preserve it, the people will come and then the people will spend the money. Hiring all the local guides now. And when you have an entire community that benefits economically from all of this revenue from tourism, they will protect the wildlife more than any government agency can. There's not going to be any corruption or anything like that. They're going to be a, have a job as a naturalist guide. That's value to them. And then there's all the other animals that, that luckily, um, because people want to come see orangutans, such as the proboscis monkey or the, um, the Bornean pygmy elephant, and many, many different species of birds. OK, here's a, a really good success. Now, this is a long story. I'm just going to make it very short. But this is the sun bear. The sun bear is extremely endangered because of habitat loss and also because of poaching so that they can get the bear bile. You guys heard of bear bile? It's bad. Um, it's, a, it's, a medis it's a Chinese traditional medicine. So there was one man who had a dream was to take sun bears and teach them to be wild again. Maybe that were illegally kept as pets. Teach them to be wild, then release them to try to save the species. Long story. But I bring over many uh, tourists and I have a big, big base of fans. And so if I ask for help, I get it. And I was able to raise $13,000 so that he could pay for his first sun bear to be released because very expensive, the collar, they have to use a helicopter and all these things, and the collar was very expensive. Now, and that was in 2015, but he wasn't able to ever do it. But once he was successful the one time, then it's like, oh, now we get the attention. A documentary, then the film, they filmed him, and then he got more and more notoriety. Now he's released 12 in a while. Really, I helped him get started all because of tourism, ecotourism. So now I can tell you a little bit more about China. So originally, the reason why most Americans want to come to China when there's a lot of other countries with great wildlife um, is the panda. You guys are very lucky. You have what I think is the most charismatic animal on earth. Nobody, <laughs> everybody can easily fall in love with a panda. Every, I mean, you guys in China, I call it pandemonium. 
it's a crazy obsession with pandas, which is great. That is the animal that will maybe bring people to have an appreciation for nature because they love that animal so much. Panda is a great umbrella species. If you want to save the panda, then you have to make the giant panda national park, a huge area, and preserve all of the animals <clears throat> will be preserved that live in that same habitat. So all you need to do is just show a couple pictures like this, and then boom, people show up and they want to see these panda cubs in the trees and get these kind of pictures. Then, once the tourists are there, then you can show them the real child. And that has been a very exciting thing for me because <clears throat> when I first began guiding in China, I met Shengen, and he was my national guide. And at that time in 2008, there was no ecotourism in China. There was no, there was uh, guides that could tell you the history, and then there were also people that understood animals, but they couldn't speak English. So they, there was no nature guides. That was why I was there. I, was, I came on the trip and I could explain to them all these uh, wild things because there was nobody in, in China that understood those things and also could speak English and interact with foreigners. But Philip had a dream that he wanted to do this. He believed that there was a, a way to bring tourists to, on nature-focused trips. Not just to see the Great Wall, Terracotta Warriors, the Bund in Shanghai, maybe go to Chengdu Panda Base, but that's it. Nobody ever heard of going into these reserves to see wildlife, or to come all the way to Sichuan to fill out the bird list, so to see the birds and everything. So that was, uh, he was a very much of a pioneer. And now he has a whole team of people, like Bella, Bella, I met Bella, she, she didn't <clears throat> speak very great English like now, or know any birds or anything about nature, but she was so inspired that she learned all this very quickly, and now she has a wonderful career. It's not boring. She gets to travel around, interact with foreigners. I know that in China, that if I wanted to get a job as an English teacher, I could do it overnight, because people want to be able to interact and talk to a, an American so that they can help them with the, uh, how to communicate. Bella gets that for free. 10 people come, and then they get, she gets to interact with 10 Americans who are very nice, and they get to go enjoy nature together. That job is not boring. So, so Philip and I became very, very good friends. Now I think like brothers. And I'm also Uncle Brad to Shimi. Um, but I loved China so much, although we didn't get into the wild part on those trips. With Philip and I had to develop and, and explore and be very creative and create the first nature trips ever in China. It was very difficult. <laughs> but we did it. We had the dream. But when it first came, Philip uh, said, oh, you should come back to China, just you. I can show you the wild part of China. Because so far on that trip, it was only the cities. And I could eat, I, and he showed me the real Chinese food, not the ones at the tourist sites or the five-star Western hotels. So we get into the wild part, and I fell in love with it. Absolutely fell in love. And I said, I want to find a way to, to somehow start bringing Americans to China on some type of trip like this so they can fall in love with it. You can't fall in love with China if you go on a normal trip, where you just, there's the Great Wall, you have the guide, Tell the facts about the Great Wall. Go eat at a, a tourist restaurant. And then there's the terracotta warriors. You see those great things, but you don't fall in love with the place. But if you can go into the real China, that's when you fall in love with the place. And uh, the people, the wonderful people, the, the wonderful food, and then the, all this unique scenery in Mali. So we camped out for three weeks or something, I don't know, in the mountains for a, for, a, for a couple weeks. I, and he tried to show me a wild panda. All we saw was the panda scat. But it was a crazy adventure. But I fell in love with it. I started falling in love with all these local rangers. And they'd never seen a foreigner before. Never met one. But then here's this crazy guy from Alaska who just loves animals so much. And then, when we figured it out enough, then we were able to switch our trips and then go into these beautiful places. <laughs> There's me with a panda poop. A panda poop. But it's a wild panda. So these trips were really successful. 
The trips in the 2008, maybe two trips a year, never full, almost always getting canceled. Nobody wanted to go to China with us. They'd always go on a big, cheaper trip with 40 people just because all they wanted, I want to see the Great Wall, I want to see Terrified Warriors, boom, 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 do it. But now, now that we've developed this nature trip, nature-focused trip, the trips now, except for the pandemic, we have to start again. But um, it would be like eight trips a year and all full. Because the growth and the popularity is huge. And not that, now Philip has got, I was having to rebuild it again because of the pandemic. But a team of people that are naturalist guys. Bella is a fantastic naturalist. She goes out, she knows every bird by song and sight. She also can speak brilliant English to the clients. She can read the clients, she understands the clients. And uh, she's a superstar. Xinyi wants to work uh, for, her, for her father also, and us. So she wants to do it too, because she sees that it's a, a wonderful job. And uh, yeah, so we have several people. What, uh, one of them is an is a, uh, incredible botanist. Uh, Bella is a, now a bird specialist. We have um, Karen, who's a logistical specialist, but she just loves it because she can go along and help the logistics, and then gets to go into these wonderful places beautiful national parks, and interact with these nice people. And now, what I love is to, is to bring people into China to fall in love with them. That's, that's the most fulfilling thing for me. It's because um, I believe that China is becoming very, very uh, influential in the world. Now, I understand that more than most people. And I think that it's much better for us to get along with China as Americans that things will go much better. So it's really the best way is to, one by one, make people fall in love with China. And you, China's easy to fall in love with for America. It's, it's a wonderful, fantastic place. It's beautiful, especially Sichuan. You're very lucky you live in Sichuan. Um, or a lot of you guys probably come from other parts of China and you realize how what is, I think Sichuan is like one of the best kept secrets in the world. Scenery, people, uh, food, and then also the wildlife. So these are Americans that are just absolutely loving China. And then uh, again, they come to see the pandas in the, in the, in the panda bases to get these pictures that people cannot uh, get in the United States. Now, now that China is taking back all the pandas from the zoos, now if you want to see a panda, you have to come to China. And some people, uh, this is a very famous panda. This one was at New Jagan Panda Base. This one was uh, born in Washington, D.C. So, so many followers and fans in the United States. Millions of people love this Taishan, this panda. So, some people come on the trip just to see Taishan, because now he's in China. But they were a big fan when he was in Washington, D.C. Okay, it's easy. There's Taishan. Okay, they saw Taishan. But, they didn't realize that they were going to fall in love with China. And uh, see all the birds and taste the food and everything. Now, panda is easy for people to fall in love with. It's an umbrella species. Um, very charismatic. But if you decide to save the panda, you have to have giant panda national parks, like 67 panda reserves that are theoretically can hopefully be connected. And that is going to save all these other fantastic species that nobody's ever heard of. The Jitsu Hop, Golden Monkey. Beautiful. My, my favorite primate in the world. They're, they're phenomenal. I mean, they're unbelievable. So beautiful, so entertaining, so cute, so just wow, living in these high mountains. People that come on the trips never heard of it, but we show them and they're like, wow, I never even heard of this monkey with a blue face. This is crazy, I said, I know. And if it weren't for the giant panda, all these animals would be extinct. Because the giant panda almost went extinct in the 1980s, very close to extinction. And the company that I work for is partners with World Wildlife Fund. China needed help. And lots of problems, 1980s, recovering from difficult times. And uh, they really couldn't afford to spend a lot of time and effort on conservation. They had other problems that were bigger. But they could never live with them. They never would be uh, allowed to manage the state because it's such an important part of China. They, everybody knew that. No matter how hard the time is, you know that when Wolong earthquake happened, the pandas were rescued from Wolong before people 
They took the helicopters to get the pandas out before they even started rescuing the people. So pandas very valuable. And luckily for the panda, luckily for all these other animals, that the panda exists and was safe from extinction. Now you've got these incredibly beautiful wildlife preserves. Everybody ever heard of this animal? Newly? Zatakin? Newly? Reeves and so these are all these beautiful animals that we're able to now run a, a wildlife trip. Yeah, people love it. Hey, Jew. Yeah, Jew. Yeah, Jew. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Jew. <laughs> and then, uh, Xiao Ji. Xiao Ji. And then, Ba, ba, ba Ling. And then the Sorrel. I can't remember who was Ban, uh, Sorrel's Lin. Lin,对，不是，是哇，是那里，然后它有个Goro，是丹尼，啊，刚才那个黄色的那个是小鸡，小鸡，就是呃黄鸡，叫黄鸡。This is小鸡，小鸡。嗯，and then uh，Zagatro。Old man in the mountains. So nobody knew that you could go into the high mountains and see these. Crazy primates. Like that, these are pictures that I take on the trip. Then I can show them on my social media, and then lots of people come over, which is great because I can make lots of people fall in love with China. So you know, many times as I'm dealing with nature people on a bear trip somewhere in Alaska, I'll say, "I got to China. You would love that trip." I hear this somewhere. No, I'll never go to China. Why? You'd love it. Oh, I don't want to support China. Why? Because they have a um, bad reputation of. Of um, consuming endangered species, so then you can't blame all of China for that. Just because it's helped sometimes, just because the United States has some people crazy that like to shoot guns and do terrible things, doesn't mean everybody does that. So you need to go to China and, um, and appreciate Bella and Philip or Chengen and in the future Xinyi and um, all these other amazing people that fight and, and spend their whole life appreciating and saving the wildlife. So. It's a very important job, and my favorite, the Heishong. Wo de min de, wo ju wo de min de Heishong. So these are all in the wild. We find them in the wild. Hog badger, civet, leopard cat, um, bow mouth. Oh, no. I forgot I had to see yellow throat in there. Uh, Huang Hou Diao. Huang Hou Diao. Jinji, <laughs> beautiful bird. Jinji. <laughs> when the male is calling the female in the spring, it sounds like he says Jinji. Jinji. <laughs> and all these beautiful birds: Fubu, green backed brown dipper, red billed blue magpie. Red-billed leotrix. Uh, this is, I mean, you see this, I'm sure you've seen this around. Yeah. The common. So beautiful. So beautiful. So beautiful. <laughs> so, beautiful. <laughs> so, yes, we get to see these animals, and uh, people get very excited. But what they don't realize is that we push the people into, out of their comfort zone, into um, these wonderful areas, these magical places. Um, this is uh, Qingxi village near Tanjava, and all these places are the best people in the world, the greatest food, and then they get to really fall in love, not just with the panda, they get to fall in love with China and other Chinese nature and then the Chinese people, and appreciate it, and understand, and have a taken interest in the history. Why does China do the things they do? Well, if you understood the history of China, then you would have a better appreciation, you could understand. If you understand people, you get along better with them, especially if you love them. I love, I love Chinese people. So if I was the president of the United States, no problem. <laughs> and then the most beautiful places in the world, just three hours from here. Have you seen the National Park in Germany? Uh, Four sisters? Uh, Four sisters? Uh, Four sisters? Four sisters? Four sisters? Four sisters? Four sisters? Four sisters? Beautiful places, also part of the Giant Panda National Park. 
the only reason it's there. Got it now. So beautiful. I can't believe how beautiful this is. <laughs> okay, so some of the, the other things that we've done in our trips in the past is I realized as I as I uh, knew she needed as, as a small child, and she would teach me. I was Uncle Brad. She would, I would learn what was it like to be a student in China. And one of the things, being a nature lover, I said, ah, do you ever study animals or anything? And I, and I figured out that the, the schools, of all these schools, they don't even have any animal books. They, you know, I mean, they, you were getting trained to be doctor, engineer, um, all these things, but you, there's, no, there's no early education to plant the seed of the love of nature. So what we would do is go into these schools, local schools, and they, of course they'd never seen foreigner before because they live in a remote area in the mountains. All of a sudden, <laughs> I come in with ten people from America, and two people from Australia. Wow, never seen this before. So it really gets their attention. But then I focus: Why? Why are why are we here in your tiny village in the Minchang? In the Minchang? Why? Because you have beautiful animals and beautiful scenery. Oh, wow, really? Yes, we love the Jinji. Shi Huan Jinji. Shi Huan Yoni. Shi Huan Zhang Zhou Jinsu Hao. So then we also purchased many books, nature books, and added to the library. So here's these gorgeous books about animals. Please try to fall in love with animals so that you can help maybe protect them. Maybe you'll get lucky enough to have a job like Bella if you, if you have that love of nature. So that's one of the things that we would do. And why is this important? Because the young generation is going to be very much hugely influential in the world. Chinese people are going to be very influential, much, I mean, they already are. But compared to 10 years ago, now, huge, huge change in 10 more years. So I want everyone to have this love of nature so that as the world progresses and develops, that will actually be a priority. Okay. So here's one little story. I got, I'm going to give you guys some homework. You know where this is? Very close. Okay, but this is how much, how crazy. So some people call me, my, my, my Chinese name is Heishan. My other Chinese name is Made So we were, I took the tourists to this ancient town, and then I was shocked. Oh no! What is this? Why? This guy has caught these wild birds to put in a cage. Why would you do that? And I told him, I said, that's bad. The bird wants to be free. It's a wild bird. It's not a parrot from the pet store. Why would you do that? And he just, oh, he's very mean. I said, look, I'm warning you. You need to release them, or I'm going to come back, and you're going to face consequences. <laughs> and he, he didn't know what to do. He just, oh. he said, I'm, I'm, com I'm coming back. You better be gone. Well, I'll come back in two weeks. It's still there. <laughs> I said, hey, I warned you. So we went and got the police. <laughs> And I don't know what the police did, but I'd like to maybe go check and see. But this is your homework. If you see somebody using the old tradition of catching a wild bird and putting it in a cage for their own entertainment, tell them that's not okay. Help change some of these older things. I mean, America has lots of problems and many bad things. But this is just, just show that. You know, you guys can be the leaders of like preserving nature. So one of the birds that was in the cage is the red bow It's that beautiful bird. Well, let's say this guy is enjoying his birds in the cage. I don't know why would somebody be so sick as to enjoy that, but let, let's say he does. And then all the other stores, oh, I want that too. I want to have a beautiful bird in the cage. Well, soon you'll have no birds left at the park when you walk around. How terrible is that? So I just encourage you guys to stand up and have an appreciation for conservation because without things like wild birds, these beautiful animals, reserves, things like that, the world is a bleak place. So, luckily, China has a ban. And, amazingly enough, China has a bad reputation for um, animal things, right? The black market, 
illegal species, you know, ivory trade. The world has an opinion of China for that. The whole world, all of they think they, the whole, all of China has the reputation, just for a, what happens from a few people. But I believe that's changing. We just have to make the change faster. But what I always tell the people, ironically, you know, you think China is always killing nature. But the giant panda saving from extinction is the greatest conservation success in the history of the world. So, congratulations. And I, I'm very proud to always tell people that. The Chinese have done things to save the giant panda. No other, much more powerful and great success. I mean, I, I, mean, I could talk for a whole hour on how, what, the whole history of the giant panda conservation story. But I don't have time for that, but I'm just saying. But anyway, so I'm just recognizing uh, the good thing. 67 panda reserves. 17% increase in their population of wild panda since 2003. A couple of years ago, I was on a, guiding a photography trip to Yellowstone National Park. And before the pandemic, this park is very popular. But I went there, I said, wow, at least 50% of the people visiting Yellowstone are, are from mainland China. I can look at uh, people and I can listen to them and see how they dress. I, oh, they're from mainland China. Or I can say, oh, they're from maybe Hong Kong or oh, they're from somewhere else. Uh, yeah, so I thought it was great because what's happening 10 years ago, no, you never see mainland Chinese person in these parts. But now, China has money. China's now developing, so they can afford to appreciate nature. Now, lots to go to the United States. So, this is a point. If you love nature, I, and every one of these, all, a lot of these Chinese, uh, they go on a tour. And so somebody from China's job is to guide these Americans around the National Park. Because they can speak English, and then they also can speak Chinese, and they understand what the, what the Chinese tourist needs, and then can help take care of them. That's my job. Except instead of me bringing Americans to China, they bring Chinese to America. So popular. But I bet you, I would, I would surely say, none of those guides has a real, maybe, love, knowledge, and appreciation of nature. Maybe that could be, if, if you guys do, I know Bella does and Xin Yi does. If you guys are like, obviously you came here today on your day off on Saturday, so you must. But if you take an interest and get educated in nature and tourism at the same time, there's going to be some amazing, very not boring jobs for you. Imagine, your job is to take Chinese tourists to the most beautiful places in North America and the rest of the world. That would be very exciting. And you would do very well and be very popular and rare if you had a really strong understanding of nature. You could explain, why is this bison like this, I can tell you how it evolved. Or this bird is related to that one because this, you know, or explain the natural history or explain the life cycle of grizzly bear. So I'm just telling you, um, yes, there's lots of great opportunities for people that are a bit creative and can mix nature and tourism together. So China's love of conservation is growing. I, this is one of my biggest heroes. Have you ever heard of somebody named Yao Ming? Yeah. Yeah. You've heard of him? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know you've heard of him. So, everybody's very famous because, yeah, he's a beast. Oh, I've seen videos, the highlight reel, and he just dominates all of the other basketball players. No problem. Smack him out of the way. So incredible. Well, obviously, he's going to be very famous in China, a huge national hero. Well, a lot of people become very famous, and what do they do? Oh, they have lots of money, then they just go party, and they buy another boat, and just whatever. But some famous people are my heroes. What does Yao Ming do with this fame? He encourages the Chinese to for conservation, save the endangered species, things like this. Don't do the sharp thin soup. And I believe, in my opinion, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, that if uh, Yao Ming might be the, the second most influential person in China, next to Xi Jinping. When Yao Ming says something, maybe they listen. You think so? If, if Yao Ming tells you something, would you listen? Immediately, 
就说，然后你是借习近平以后的第二代有具有影响力的人物在中国，你们觉得这样吗？That's very important because China is growing very fast. I know that. You guys are going to be the generation that will almost control the world. So, may as well have a little appreciation of nature, maybe even have a great career from it. So, I under, uh, the United States people, they don't pay attention to this stuff, but I know how China is planning and how influential it will be. So, okay, I think that's, that's all right now. Um, yeah, so I have a few questions. Also, um, can I ask Bella or Philip, would you like to come up Bella. and add anything? Bella, uh, so I'm going to introduce you to today. We're going to take a seat here. Zhang Zuyang. He just introduced you to him. He from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is not very good. Completely don't know. Uh, Zhang Zuyang is a very good teacher. He's 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 a very good teacher. 它能够赋予我什么东西？我们应该怎么去接触它？怎么去走进它？那么我们父辈给我们创造了我们今天的这种财富。那么我们去如何去创造一个更加美好的明天？那么我们需要每一个人去投入、去走入。那么我觉得张张祖阳，您的学姐呢，可能比我更有资历去给大家讲这些东西。好，非常谢谢。